Good evening, everybody. Um, I hope you can all see my screen um, and you can all hear me. If you can't put some messages in the, in the chat, um, and I'll stop. OK, so things I'm going to be talking about this evening. So a very quick introduction um, to me, which Sam's all very, very kindly, already kindly done. Um, a quick introduction to Small Robot Company, a very quick introduction to what we're aiming to do. Um, and then the bulk of it's all going to be about uh, the robots and the technical challenges that we've had with those robots. Um, and how we got to where they are and, and what they do. So, um, as Sam said, um, a bit of a varied career. Some people say that I've got a very, very short attention span. It tends to be jobs for three years and careers for 15 years. Um, so, um, and kind of, uh, kind of something that all the youngsters ask at, at work is, you know, why, why do you keep, why do you keep changing? Also, it's, it's a challenge and, and being able to do different things. Um, but it was really fun, good fun doing an MSc um, in mechatronics. I actually ended up um, sitting next to one of the guys I taught physics to at A level um, in uh, in one of the lectures, which was which was really interesting. Um, so enough about me. Um, let's talk about small robot companies. So the small robot company um, has a mission, uh, and it's to help farmers feed the world while while regenerating the planet um, using our robots, Tom, Dick, and Harry. Uh, to deliver per plant farming to the world's biggest food crops. And the key thing on, on all this for us is really this idea of per plant farming is that, that if we can deal with plants on an individual plant basis, um, we can be much more precise um, about what we're doing and what we're delivering to those plants. Um, and a little bit of background about that. Um, over the years, um, soils and, and uh, Fields have disappeared, are being eroded. Um, there's climate change happening. Um, but with the farmers, the costs have gone up a massive amount in the last 20 years. Um, they've not really gained that much in yields and revenues. Um, with the massive use of pesticides and herbicides, there's been a massive increase in uh, weed resistant and pest resistant uh, pests. Um, and at the moment, most of the profits that farms are making comes from subsidies, um, and certainly in the UK. Um, in New Zealand, that all changed, and it really knocked their, the farming back for a long period of time, but they're now, now becoming more and more competitive. Um, so if we don't change the way we're doing agriculture, we're going to continue to get the same results. So the way we're doing it at the Small Robot Company is we've got a suite of robots, and we, we're really good at naming robots. Um, but our key, key robots are Tom, um, who's the monitoring robot. And we see an example of Tom on the left. Um, we've got Dick, who is the doing robot. Um, and we've got an example of Dick. We'll talk more about Dick later on. Um, we've got Harry, which is still at the prototype stage. And we've got Wilma, which is our advice engine. And the, tonight I'm going to be talking largely about uh, Tom, how we do this, how we actually collect the data taking that data and then putting it into Wilma, how Wilma deals with that, all, all that data, and then what we do with, with that information or what the farmer can do with that information with Dick to go out and um, take some action on the fields. Um, what I'm going to do now is going to um, stop sharing and we're going, going to play a, a video which kind of sums up everything and then we'll talk in more detail around that. So. Um, I'm just going to optimize for video. Can everybody hear that? We're here on the Lockerley Estate in Hampshire, and we've been trialing here yeah, since awesome. autumn, and now into the spring. To prove the power of per plant farming, we are focusing on answering the biggest problem that farmers face at the moment, which is weaving. So we're working with uh, farmers in the UK to be able to provide them with an ongoing view of their crop plants and their broadleaf weeds in the field. One of the newest tools in the toolbox for us at, at Lockerley is the relationship with the small robot company. The robot offers us a real chance to stop using artificial inputs, which goes towards our regenerative model of farming. 
effective as a synergy between pharma and scientist. With the new generation of robotics, we're really focusing on every individual plant in the field rather than taking a blanket view that we're going to spray an entire field with a pesticide. We have delivered this end-to-end -end service. That is taking our TOM, who is now developed up to a commercial specification, to be able to gather the data. TOM then passing that data to Wilma, our AI-driven operating system, who is now capable of absorbing terabytes of information and converting that to per plant information in the field. And then that information being passed to Dick, who then goes out to the field to find the individual weeds that Tom has seen through his cameras and then killing those with electricity. This is our Tom V3 robot. He's now covering 2.5 hectares an hour, so 20 hectares in, a, in an eight hour shift. Tom will go out in the field, do a survey, um, and we'll be able to take a, a really detailed picture of literally every millimetre of the field that they're looking at. So for instance, this field is 11 hectares, 25 acres. This field will turn into a million little fields within a field, and that, that accuracy of data is really important. It's really exciting to be in a situation where we now have a commercially viable product in Tom. These capabilities are also really applicable to lots of other players in the wider ag industry. And what we can offer them is quite literally billions of data points and the opportunity for every field to become a trial plot. So we've moved to the point now where we can take the data from Tom, absorb it into Wilma, process it through the AIs and create this per plant map in the field. This year we are focused on improving the granularity uh, and detail of the data that we're feeding into Wilma to be able to monitor every single plant in the field as it grows over the course of the season. So this is using the Wilma AI to say this particular weed is a, is a very severe threat to the target crop and then to go in and choose which plants we treat and choose exactly how we treat them. We can recognise the type of weed if we don't want to kill that particular weed and the farmer can make the decision about that. We're not looking to eliminate everything from every crop. Let's identify weeds that can actually bring benefits. The robots can do that, but I can't be selective with a herbicide that goes through a chemical sprayer. In phase three, we're using our non-chemical weeding robot, Dick, to go out and kill those weeds. Electrical weed zapping, which we produce by Rootwave, puts an electric current through a weed from the tip all the way through to the root. It's very similar to a lightning strike. The biggest challenge that farmers are facing at the moment is around herbicide resistance and, and, and weed control. We went to farmers and said, right, well, you tell us what is the most important thing for us to solve. Unanimously, it came back, yeah, herbicide resistance. Weeds, just can't control them. We have got resistant weed issues in big parts of the UK with, with grass weeds in particular. Black grass is, is crippling. It's costing the industry a fortune. The cost of pesticides have gone up 50% in 10 years. It's the number one problem which is here now when it needs to be fixed. We can't continue to go at this pace, so we need to change. And that's where the robots offer us a different solution. Now we can recognise the weeds in the shot and we can get the probe onto those weeds. At that point, we can do what we want. The robotic platforms we've got at the moment can have many, many different technologies bolted onto them and the world's our oyster on that. It could be really powerful and industry changing. We've been here today on a field trial and we've had technology and we've shown, we've shown that it works, but we need to get to the point where we can drop it in any field, on any day, anywhere in the country and internationally as well. Our next stage is being able to take the proof of concept of our electric weeding system and convert that into a commercially viable, robust, service. Product design is really important for us. We don't want to continue to reinvent the wheel every time. We want to take chunks that we know work and reapply them onto as many platforms as we can. The real benefit around that is that it allows us to be able to create this modular platform for our robotics, to have reusable components. So in 2023, when our machinery is ready, we are going to be able to ramp up massively. The industry is changing beyond recognition and I think um, whether you adapt or you just watch, we should have an ear towards robots in agriculture. The robots can offer a heck of a lot more in my opinion than just, just treating weeds. In my lifetime robots will be uh, a huge part of our farming system. For me it's endless, the potential is endless.
go back. Okay, so that was um, one of our promotional videos um, talking about that, and it, it, it shows really nicely uh, what we're aiming to do for the full um, taking everything all the way through from uh, protecting a weed, putting it in warmer, doing something about it, and, and, and feeding back. Um, I just have to say apologies for my haircut. It was um, just uh, during, at, filmed right at the end of lockdown. Um, and I can see I desperately needed a haircut by then. So I'd um, like to talk now about some of the robots in some more details. So um, what we've got here is the Tom V3. So um, the, the history on it is we had a Tom V1, a Tom V1.5. We missed the version two and we went straight to the version three. Um, so the aim of the Tom robot is to be able to take really, really um, good pictures uh, of the ground and geolocate those ground, those weeds on the ground as accurately as possible um, in order for the farmer then to be able to, to see that. So if you imagine Google Earth um, on steroids, you come down, you come down, you come down, and you can see rocks, you can see individual weeds. Um, so in order to do that, we're using RTK um, um, and GPS for getting um, as accurate as we can. Um, safety is really important, and we'll talk more about that later on. Um, suspension um, is also important because we need to be able to keep the uh, cameras as steady as possible, otherwise we're going to get motion blur. Motion blur. Um, the shells made out of um, expanded polystyrene, um, many, many reasons, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, the chassis uh, is made of uh, aluminium. Um, and we've got a carbon fiber boom. Um, and we're able to operate it uh, manually, so it becomes a very, very expensive remote control car, um, which, is, which is useful for getting robots in and out of the back of vans and so on. Um, it can also operate uh, autonomously, so we can put it in a, in a, a geofence field uh, with a route planned on it, and it can move up and down. Um, and um, in time, we, we're hoping to be able to have remote autonomous operation. So weight's really, really important for us um, because of the ground pressure um, and of all the driving factors, trying to get the weight right uh, was really important because the heavier it is, the more battery it takes, the more battery it takes, the heavier the batteries become. The heavier the batteries become, the greater the weight is, the more batteries you need. So you go into a horrible death spiral on the whole thing. The, uh, the design aim for it was to have a compaction of 3.7 kilopascals. What that actually means is we want to, to have roughly the same ground pressure as a farmer would walking across the field in his wellies. So if the farmer walks onto the field and he sinks in, then our robots would also sink in. Um, so it means that we can, we can get into fields without doing much damage. And compaction is one of the reasons, uh, one of the ways that the fields really um, lose their fertility um, and their ability to grow, grow crops. Um, the speed we want to operate at is around about one and a half meters per second with a six meter image sweep. Uh, and that gives us roughly our coverage of 2.5 hectares an hour. Um, we're designed to go into crops up to growth stage 31. So um, I'm sure not many of you know about growth stage 31. I certainly didn't two years ago. But um, with wheat, you can walk on, on wheat um, and it actually does it quite a lot of good uh, up to growth stage 31. After growth stage 31, then it starts to put out the uh, shoots which the wheat's going to grow on. Uh, if you drive on it after that point, you actually damage the wheat and you reduce the, uh, reduce the yield for the farmers. Um, and the whole thing is designed so that the boom folds and it will go into uh, the back of a, uh, a big sprinter van. So, Let's talk through some of the some of the major challenges on there. So, um, in no particular order. So, first one is boom st stabilization. With with the cameras, they do have a degree of autofocus on there. Um, but any uh, any camera buffs out there will know that with, with optics, your field of 
uh, depth of field is a function of your aperture setting. So that the if the aperture is closed down, you get a big uh, depth of field, which is good because it means that you can have a lot of variation in the camera height as it bounces up and down. Um, however, with a closed down aperture, you don't get um, as much light in, so your images are poorer, so you have to have a longer exposure. And if your boom's moving up and down, you get uh, image blur, which is a problem. So getting the boom so it works it is really stable, is a really, really important challenge for us. And a lot of work was done um, on the suspension. We had Randall who did um, do a lot of rally cars, um, doing a lot of modeling on that, um, and a lot of work on making sure the boom stayed as stable as we could get it, particularly with the big six meter width. And you can see on the film, it, it was wobbling, but we can, with the camera settings at the moment, we can get away with, uh, with that level of wobble. Um, so that was a, a really, really challenging part for the mechanical engineering guys. Um, with the autonomy, um, the autonomy is, is an area that we're, we're working really hard on. Um, and it is key to success for us because in time, we want to be able to put robots into what we're going to call a kennel in the field. So a little garage on the, in the field um, and then remotely, in two or three years' time, you should be able to press a button, the robot drives out and goes and does a survey in the appropriate part of the field um, and uploads everything. At the moment, we're, we're having it with robot handlers who will go out, uh, particularly for a safety point of view, um, just in case um, somebody comes out and, and sees the robot um, and keeps an eye on it in case anything goes wrong. So the autonomy is really, really important for us. About that. Um, Sorry, Andy, I dropped out for a minute there, but it seems like you're doing a really good job by yourself there. Um, my internet disabled, but I'm back on now, so I'm here Super. for your support. But I think you're doing a good job. <laughs> Sorry, good. <laughs> That's all right. Um, so um, with the autonomy uh, at the moment, Wilma puts in a a plan to uh, for where the robot's going to drive. Um, so the robot handler puts in a, a plan for where, where the robot's going to drive and the robot line follows um, all the way through. Um, so there's a big challenge on that. Are we going to really work on improving that? So localization, knowing exactly where the robot is and where the pictures are, is also really important. I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next, next slide. Ground pressure, I talked about uh, on the previous one, we're aiming to be at the same ground pressure as a farmer walking onto a field. Um, the next one, is human robot interaction. So this was, this was something that our founders um, are really, really keen on. Um, if you look at a lot of the other agricultural robots, they look like they're designed by engineers in that they're square and blocky and really, really functional. And if you look at the, the Jill robot that, that we worked on, that is really square and blocky and really functional, but it looks a little bit scary and a little bit kind of, you, you wouldn't want to see it going around the field. It's not, it's not, um, a, not a happy robot. So for one of the things that we've worked on, and there's, there's quite a lot of people out there working on it now, is the, is the idea of how will how will the public deal with seeing a robot in the field? So we're aiming that we're going to have thousands of these robots out in the fields in the future. And we want it to be a, a good experience for them, and we don't want kids going throwing stones at them or being scared of them. We want a, a nice reaction. So um, part of it is how does it look, and we, we're trying to go for organic shapes. And if you look at the Tom, um, Tom V3 that you saw there, there's a lot of thought went into this, the shape and the colors uh, and the way it looks. So it's got a little bit of an animal look about it. Um, and that will be a theme all the way through on our robots to make them, make them look um, non-scary. Um, another um, major part for us is, is data storage. If you can imagine we're taking thousands and thousands and thousands of pictures and we and along with gps data um, we've got a massive amount of data that we need to store on the robot and then upload to wilma um, so that is a that is a real challenge uh, for us um, and the last part in, is detection so at the moment we're using um, fairly standard rgb cameras um, which 
which work really work really well. But there's a lot of other work we, we're doing about uh, ver using various spectrums of light to see various things. There's a lot of research papers out there about um, being able to detect diseases um, in the near infrared and in the ultraviolet, um, and shining various lights onto the onto the crops and look at the ref reflectivity of all those things. So there's a lot of work we can do in time on using different different spectrums of cameras, which is which is really interesting. Um, I just want to talk a little bit more about about the how do we identify the exact point that a weed or a bug or a slug or a bit of disease or a rock is on the map. So the robot um, knows where it is um, with kind of three things really. So we've got the GPS. So we've got a standard GPS on the robot. And as you all know, a GPS moves around quite a lot um, due to uh, the Americans changing the GPS settings to um, fluctuations in, in the atmosphere and so on. So we have a GPS on the robot and we also have a GPS base station. Um, and those two talk to each other um, and they can eliminate a lot of the error that actually occurs there. Um, another thing we've got is on the robot is an IMU, inertial measurement unit. Um, so it, it measures where we are. We've got odometry on the wheels um, and all that stuff is put through some RTK to actually give us as good a uh, position for where the robot is um, at any one time. And we also know exactly where the cameras are on the robot. So using all that information and transforms, we can then get the GPS location of where every picture is. Uh, and that's all saved on an SSD on the robot, ready for uploading um, to Wilma. Um, and here's a little bit um, more on this. This is black grass. Everybody's talking about um, black grass. Uh, it is a real problem for farmers in that it has become um, herbicide resistant uh, in a lot of areas. And if you get one bit of black grass in your crop, it rapidly becomes thousands and thousands of, of black grass, which competes with the wheat um, and causes all sorts of problems. So there's a lot of work going on on using um, multi-spec cameras, multi-spec lights to actually identify uh, the black grass uh, live or identify the black grass and we can then use Wilma then to do some AI to recognize it. So um, if I just stop at that point uh, and we're going to go on and talk about Wilma and we're then going to go on and talk about electric weeding and uh, slug bot. So uh, does anybody have any questions at the moment? Um, Andy, there was there is a question. Uh, because my internet dropped out, I, I didn't hear if you were answering any, uh, but someone said, could miscreants run off with a freely operating robot in a field? Far, robot yes. hustling. <laughs> yes, um, that, is, that is always going to be a possibility, yes. Um, and um, the whole reaction with, with the public and you know, how are we going to deal with the security of robots um, and also the data encryption. Um, you know, we don't want somebody hacking our robot and driving it driving off. So there's a whole load of work that we need to do on robot security. Um, at the moment, it's not a problem for us because we've got robot handlers. Um, but everybody knows, well, a lot of farmers have a lot of problems with kind of things like odd bikes being stolen. So we're going to have the same problem. But we will have um, GPS trackers on there. So we should know if something's been stolen, we'll know where, it, where it's gone at least. But yes, it is a problem. Um, and we don't have, currently have a good solution for that. But it's one we need to work on. But it's the same with anything, isn't it? Outside, lawn mowing robots, et yes. cetera. Yeah, they've, they've come with alarms. Um, if you don't mind just taking another quick question. No, of course. Do you, do you plan to combine the different functions into one robot? Because it seems quite hard to get the two robots to agree on sub-centimetre positioning. That's a, that's a really, really good question. So our, our current model, is that the Tom robot will go out and do a lot of, of surveying work. And we'll talk about this more when we come to electric weeding, but the idea uh, with the slugs as well is that when we come back, we'll have an AI sitting on, the, on the, the doing robot and the doing robot will then be able to find that point again. But yes, it is an issue being able to get back to that sub, sub one centimeter GPS positioning. Um, 
the more work we do on it, the better we, we will be at getting back to that point. Um, at the moment, our solution on that is using edge, art, edge AI on the robots. Okay, great stuff. There are a few questions coming in, but I think just to keep to time, Andy, uh, we'll, we'll carry on and I'm monitoring the questions as usual and the chat. Super. Um, okay, so um, Wilma. Wilma is um, our operating system, if you like. It's, it's our way that the farmer can actually see what's happened and then implement what he wants from that. So the idea is that the farmer sits in the middle and can say, make lots of uh, choices about that. So um, Wilma takes, we take all the photographs uh, and the data from the TOMS, we upload it. That um, takes a lot of um, internet, um, takes a lot of, lot of data to actually get stuff uploaded. Um, and then with various algorithms, we convert the, all the pictures into a map of the field. Um, so we can actually see the map, see where they are, and we, we've got a really, really accurate map of everything in that field. Um, at that point, we can then run um, all those pictures through an AI, and the AI can then do detections. <clears throat> at the moment, we can detect broadleaf weeds well, we can detect emerging crops, um, and we're starting to look at um, emerging other sorts of emerging crops. So it's a big, a big piece of work is actually making the, all the AI work. And it, as, as I'm sure you know, it's all about training data and training it in the right way. So Wilma has a, produces a big map and shows the farmer in his field where all the various detections are. Um, and then from that, the, the farmer can then make a decision about what he's going to do. And the little video on the left is kind of showing how you can zoom in right down to, uh, to see it. And if you've got a query about an individual centimeter square of your, your field, because you've got a detection on that there in, in orange, goes down, goes down, goes down. You can actually see what's going on there. Um, and there's all sorts of work continuing with Wilma. Wilma will be a continually developing uh, product. Um, and we've just taken a load of people on um, a small robot company. Uh, to look after the AI side. We, work, we did subcontract it. We've now built a team up um, with some uh, ex-Google people in there. So we've got a, a really powerful team working on the AI. So we can see here, um, we have uh, the images, images are done. It all goes pumped through the AI. Uh, that is then given a, a job file back to the robots again. Um, this is the current AI structure. I'm not an AI expert by a long way, but we take raw, raw images. Um, there's a lot of work being done about labeling, um, and identifying the weeds. It's very difficult to tell the difference between black grass and wheat. Um, so we need some experts who, to do that. So there's a massive piece of work on doing that. Um, that gives us um, an inference engine. Uh, and we then have a load of weeds detected, which we can then feed in a job package to our working robot, the dick robot. Um, and this is moving through it again. So with our new team, they've come up with a new data flow. Um, and no doubt in another six weeks time, we'll have another data flow as we continually develop what's going on on here. Uh, but it's a, it's a really, really important part of our work, um, getting everything working on that. And the other thing that we can, that we're designing it is to be able to put in all sorts of other things. So we can put in um, what the weather's been over the last um, months, we could say, um, what's the time? How's that going to affect what we've got? If somebody's got some drone images that they want to put in, we can put add those in there. We could, we'll talk about soil, soil data. We can put soil data into that. So will, every bit of information will go into, into Wilma in the future to be able to enable the farmers to make better decisions on everything. Um, and here, on, on here, these are all detections of emerging wheat. Um, so another way, if we wanted to do weedy, you could say, actually, this is all the wheat. Farmer could say, actually, I've been really successful, but in this area here, I'm missing, I'm missing some crops. Is there a way we can get back in there and replant some crops? Or if we've got a detection here and a weed here, we know uh, that we need to go and get rid of that weed. So lots and lots of different things we can do uh, in the future with our AI capabilities. 
Um, and one of the ones that I really like is the fact we'll be able to identify some weeds, which although um, they're weeds, they're not crop, they might be beneficial weeds. It might be clover, for instance, which, which fixes nitrogen. Um, so you really wouldn't want to kill the clover. And if we can identify that and leave that alone, or give the, the farmer the opportunity, excuse me, to say, I really want to leave that alone, that would be really good. So a tremendous amount of future with, with AI, and every week it seems to be getting better and better and better as compute improves and the algorithms improve. So the big challenges we've got on Wilmer, and there's a lot. Um, one of the, well, the biggest ones I notice is the data uploads. We, we, have, we, we deal with lots of data, which we have to upload to Wilma, which sits in the cloud, uh, and that takes a long time. So people are working really hard on compressing data. Do we compress data on the robots? Do we compress data in the kennel? Whereabouts do we do the data compression? What information do we need to send up? What information do we, do we need to send down? Um, AI training. Um, finding people who are expert identifying weeds and then are happy to go and then spend hours and hours and hours putting boxes around weeds as training data uh, is quite hard. Um, and we're training our own people up to do that as well. But, but the, the standard of training really um, guarantees the standard of our detections. So that's a really, really important part of what we're doing. Um, another area which we are now uh, getting into, so just to, I didn't really mention it at the beginning. When I started at Small Robot Company, uh, at the beginning of my final project from my MSC, there were about eight people in the company. When I joined, there were 15 people in the company, and we're now up to 50 people in the company. So we're growing really, really fast. Um, and uh, we've got some, some really good um, user interface and user experience people working on Wilma to make sure that the data is given to the farmer in the best possible way so he can actually take some good action from that. Um, and then another challenge for Wilma is, okay, we've got all that information now. How do we output that information to make it useful for the robots to move to actually do something with? So we've now used Tom, got the data. Wilma said, in this corner of the field, there are a load of weeds and now we're on to the uh, non-chemical weeding. So this is a project uh, that I've been working on uh, for about a year and a quarter now. Um, and the, the, I never get tired of seeing the image on the right, which is um, a weed being um, hit with electricity. So the workflow for this will be, uh, Wilma will come out with a job file, and on that job file it will say, in this field we've got Pumps of weeds in, in these areas. Here's a route to go and, for, go and follow uh, and do some weeding. So then Dick drives the route. Um, and using the on Dick, we have uh, cameras and we have a um, smaller version of Wilma. Um, uh, it's running on a, a Jetson Nano at the moment. No, it's not, sorry, it's running on a Jetson Xavier at the moment. Um, and we upload the, upload the picture to the AI. The AI gets detections, we use those detections along with the information that's come from Wilma. So it kind of works like, okay, where are you at the moment? Are you, are you close to this area? We've got a detection. Yes, that, so Wilma said there's a, there's a weed there. Our AI says there's a weed there. So it's probably definitely a weed. Let's go and zap it. Or actually nothing matches up here. Um, perhaps we don't need to weed it, it might be crops. And, the aggressiveness of the weeding can be set by the farmer. So if he says, actually, I don't care about the crop too much at this stage, but I really, really need to get rid of all this black grass, we say, don't worry about it too much. If you hit some crops, we're not worried. Or you could set it the other way and say, actually, not so worried about the weed, but definitely don't damage the crop. And the farmer can make that decision. Um, once the weed's been detected, um, the, there's a whole road of path planning that needs to go on to move the arm above the weed to zap for the appropriate time. After that weeding's happened, we can then take a picture. We've got the cameras there anyway, and we can take that back and go to the farmer and say, you know, this is what we've done. These are the weeds we found. This is what they look like immediately afterwards. And then in time, we could do a survey afterwards as well. So the farmer could then say, actually, how useful has that all been? So that's, that's the workflow. That's how um, everything should work. So um, here we've got, so, it's an interest, 
the, the robot we've got there is uh, commercially, or it's a, a Jack robot, but because it's a prototype, we've named it Jill. Um, and we can see here, um, I quite like this photograph because the tractor is the same age as I am, um, and it's kind of, uh, kind of old and new. Um, so we can see on here, we've got five um, IGAS arms, so five Delta robots, um, and it's fairly big. But the, the robot is actually designed to shrink down to, to this size, which we should be able to get into a box fan. And we're working to get it, get it down into a, into a sprinter fan. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the electrical weeding. So there's four parts to the system. So the electrical weeding part of it was developed by a company called Rootwave, who's a startup like us. Um, we've got the robot, which, which carries the uh, electric weeding stuff around, and a robot arm. Um, the robot arms what we move to the weed, um, and then we've got the AI, which tells us where the weed is and gives us that final uh, move, movement position of the uh, of the probe. Um, with the AI as well, we we do a very very crude. Um, if it's this area, we need to zap for this amount of time because um, at times the only thing we can we can vary on the root load box at the moment, so we. Um, it produces a set amount of power, which I can't tell you about. But it produces a set amount of power, which um, we, we vary the time on between about 300 milliseconds and about 800 milliseconds. In time, we're hoping to be able to vary the power, uh, use the AI to say this is the best point at which we need to touch the probe onto the weed um, to make it work. Um, and we can vary the time. And as we get better, we can, we can fine tune this. Um, the progression for this um, has been quite interesting. So um, our, what we're working really hard on is getting the probe to above the weed. And the reason for that is if electric weeding doesn't work or we find it's not appropriate for doing many other things, if we can get the technology to move the probe accurately above something we detect, at that point, we can do anything. So if somebody develops a specific weed death ray, we could put a weed death ray on that probe. We could put um, mechanical weeding. We could put a sprayer on there, which sprayed very, very small amounts of herbicide or pesticide. So that's what we've been working really hard on is getting the robot arm to move to these points. Um, and the way we, we started off, um, and bearing in mind that there was only what there was only a year ago, there was only me. Um, about nine months ago, there was two of us, and now there's four of us all together working on it. So we started off with using Aruco codes uh, to fine tune the cameras and the arm. Um, we then moved to color detection using computer vision. And then as our eight AI team came on board, we've now got an AI and we can detect using edge AI. Um, we can detect weeds using edge AI to get the, our arm accurately above the weed. Um, I thought sort I'd of show these, I won't, won't won't change it very much because um, it's a bit dodgy anyway. So here is one of our really, really, really early robots. So what we've, what we've got on top is um, a CNC router, which we use as our robot. Uh, they're e-bike wheels at the bottom. Um, and you can see that's the, uh, the probe going down. We had a few control problems with it. You can see it's shaking like crazy as it, as it moved on. But as a proof of concept, it worked quite well and didn't actually cost that much money. Um, and we can see, again, very, very unsmooth. We've moved to, moved to a point. I'm just going to move down now um, and just do some sapping. Um, what you didn't see was me in the background sticking the return probe in, so we got a circuit. Um, so that was kind of one of our early versions of doing that. Um, and This is when we've um, now moved away from the CNC router. We've got the IGAS arms in there. This is quite nice because you can see the return probe, uh, which is in the ground at the moment. Um, and we're just moving around, uh, doing vague detections at this point um, um, and uh, killing, killing the grass in the field at our headquarters. So there's been 
well, every day is a technical challenge for us. Um, the big one for us um, is working with the really high voltages um, and not, uh, not hurting anybody. Um, this is a big learning, learning curve on, on doing all that and making sure everything's safe on that. Um, we've been building proof of uh, concept prototypes like crazy to show people and show investors. We've had a lot of works on work on kinematics, converting detections to movements, um, merging the data, the map from Wilma, the AI detections, the robot position and GPS, and all the errors involved in that has been, been really, really tricky. Weeding and moving is a big challenge for us. We'll look a little bit more about that on the next slide. Batteries, um, we're using power to, to kill the weeds. That's really important to us. Um, and the next part is really, how does root wave kill? If it boils, if it boils a plant, the maths on how it works is very different to it. Actually, is it the electricity that goes through and disrupts it? So we don't really know the answer to that yet. And we need to do more investigations on that to find out exactly how the whole thing work, works. And this is just one small problem as we start moving away from um, weeding stationary to weeding on the move. Um, is how do we how do we route our two arms which are they're going to be trailing each other how do we route that in a sensible manner um, and this way might be satisfactory this way will be better how much time do we want, do we want to spend initially doing that as in our on our proof of concept prototype so there's a lot of lot of work to do that and it's a really really small team um, and we've got, to, we've got to get the right balance between coming up with a, a really good, smart algorithm to actually getting something out there that's working. Um, and that's everything um, at the moment on electric weeding. So um, probably a good time to take any more questions on, on that, if there are any. Yeah, thanks, Andy. Um, I've just, uh, well, I'm not reading this one out. This came about a week ago, actually. But with regard the electrocution, um, how do you get a, a ground? You mentioned that you were off the camera earlier on your prototype and you were just putting a, 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 a thing into the ground, but do the wheels need to have uh, metal spikes going in to earth it or something like that? So at the moment with state, stationary weeding, we have the return spike on um, a big actuator. So that's, that's fairly easy. Um, what we're working on now is how do we actually how do we have that return probe in there? So the way RootWave do it, they, they weed and move. Uh, they've got a tractor mounted one. They use um, like a harrow, so a, wheel, a metal wheel that digs into the ground. Uh, and that works fairly well. Um, we've got other ideas on how to do it from kind of walking legs to um, some, somebody came up with the idea of having like um, uh, a harpoon that goes in um, and, and moves around. So we've got a few solutions on that one. Um, but it is, it is a tricky solution for us at the moment. Yeah, well, I'm sure there'll be a lot of people, because as the IET, there'll be a lot of members probably thinking about this already. So uh, I did mention, I did send everyone a link to the blog. So you might want to continue this conversation. And Andy can always check it later on as well in the blog. So I'm sure yeah. someone might have some ideas. Steal ideas, yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's all share and share here. That's great. <laughs> um, so uh, another one is uh, talking about the use of glyphosate in um, public areas, in towns, et cetera. The county council keeps spraying our weeds on, on the pavements. Have you any thoughts about entering the, 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 the urban market at all? Um, not at the moment. I mean, there's lot, lots and lots of different areas we could work on. Um, at the moment, I think until we get the electrical weeding side of it kind of done and done safely, then, um, we would stay away from that. I know RootWave are working on doing that. They've got um, a, a unit which mounts on the back of a pickup truck um, and they can, they can weed like that at the moment. So there, there is, RootWave are, are looking at that. Um, at the moment, we're, not, we're focusing on agricultural robots in, in fields. Um, yeah, a bit safer, I suppose. You've got this yes. autonomous guidance. You don't want to be crossing the road with a robot. Um, yes. So another uh, quick question here was, uh, do you use ROS, Robot Operating System? Yes, we do. Excellent, okay. Uh, and someone asks, uh, you mentioned a technology that sounded like 
Iger arms. Now I'm thinking Igus is in the company that make the plastic bearings. Is that right? Is it IG US? IG US, yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So so one of the things we because we're only a small team, we wanted to build our own robot arm. And that was going to take much too long. So we got in touch with Igus um, and they produced that really nice Delta robot that you can see on there, which was reliable and we could take it out of the box and get it working really, really quickly. Um, and we've had great success with them. It, it, um, we've done a lot of work on the control and the kinematics of it and uh, making it lighter and making it faster. Um, mm. But it, it saved us a load of time. So, yes, it is, the, yeah. is them. Yeah, they are a, a good company. I'll, I'll drop it in the chat, actually, a, a link to them because they've got some very good stuff as well. Um, another question came in. Have you thought about laser weeding? And uh, is there any advantage of electrocuting over laser or is it just something that you've come up with? Um, so... We 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 look at we're looking at all different methods of weeding. So laser weeding is one of them. Um, laser weeding has advantages over uh, electrical weeding in that basically you're you don't need contact with the ground. It's non-contact. Um, the issues with it are uh, it uses more energy than it would do for uh, electrical weeding. The good thing about electrical weeding is that. Um, when you weed, it takes out the root as well, whereas uh, whereas laser chops the weeds. But there's all sorts of other things that we, we we see ourselves as a platform, but we can mount other weeding types onto that. So so we could do mechanical weeding fairly easily. If somebody, as I said, so if somebody came up with a particular weeding mechanism, we could take that and mount it on our robots and use it. Yeah. I think in, in time it will be having a suite of weeding mechanisms which are appropriate for the weed and for the um, and for the terrain and the field. Yeah, I mean, it's versatility, isn't it, that you've yes. got with these devices. And yep. the question was, how many hectares a day do you, would you expect Dick to clear of weeds? Um, the jury's still out on that one. Um, and it's a really interesting question because it depends on your weed density yeah. um, and how the weeds are spread out during the, in the field. So we're still out on trials on that one, but we, mm. need, to, we need to get it fast enough to make it so it's, so it's financially viable. Yeah, I think um, currently for organics and, and hand weeding, it's uh, it's incredibly expensive. You're talking thousands, really, yes. for a for a, uh, a season to, to yes. weed this lot. So yep. maybe you could have several dicks in one field doing the job. So you know, if they are slow, you can just double them up, can't you? Well, yes, you know, well, that's that's the beauty of it. So you you can just you can scale it very easily with one person mm. looking after lots of robots. Yeah. So. And that way you're not compacting the ground with one heavy tractor or vehicle. It's lighter yes. as well. So it's less environmental uh, damage. Yep. Oh, I see you've got a slide on Slugbot, which I remember yep. Slugbot. I've seen Slugbot actually at, uh, <laughs> at UE. Yeah. So, uh, Well, with that then, I can't wait. So uh, I'll let you carry on, Andy. Thanks. Cool. So... Um, that that's our initial service that we're, we're, we're offering so with the tom's pretty well uh, is working really well um we've got the weeding which is going to be a service which we'll be trialing um in this coming season um and then we've got a couple of other projects which i'm going to talk about so slugbot is another one that i'm involved with um it's a project with chap and rothamsted um, um and the idea is to identify slugs using an ai uh, so Tom goes out, looks at, finds the slugs, Wilma recognizes it, um, and we then go out and spray the slugs. Um, the reason for doing this is slug damage can be huge, um, particularly um, in things like um, oilseed rape. Um, the chemicals that you use, the cheap chemicals you use to kill slugs are really harmful, particularly to waterways um, and anything that eats the slugs, the chemicals on that. Um, BASF have developed some nematodes, and nematodes are really small worms. Um, and there's some crazy stuff about half the world is nematodes or something that somebody told me once. Um, what happens with the nematode? The, the nematode goes onto the slug, goes into the slugs, uh, buries into the slug. The slug stops eating stuff, the slug dies, the nematodes then reproduce and, and do that. Uh, so it's a really good solution for farmers, not for the slugs particularly. Um, but it is incredibly expensive. So it's, unless you've got a really bad slug problem, if you've got a really bad slug problem, you probably need to plow your crop in anyway. So it's, it's a, very, a big problem for farmers. Um, 
So the slow bot workflow is going to be that we take the Tom cameras out to survey the field. Wilma recognizes the slugs and the slug types. Um, a job file is generated to take slug bot to the right area, and then we detect and spray slugs. Um, so this is a real um, early stage one. Um, and the work packages that we've got, this is an Innovation UK project, and the work packages we've got are that we train the AI to detect slugs, which involves collecting lots of slugs. Uh, we build a precision spraying device and we test it in the real farmer's field. So here we can see um, some examples. So this is our Tom V 1.5. So it's, a, it's a, 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 one of our earlier robots. Um, and on the back, you can see we've managed to spray. This is just spraying water um, and we're trying to get the spray as small as possible. Um, and on here, you can see just here, this is a, a standard agricultural spray. Um, lots and lots of challenges on this project. First of all, spraying. Um, using agricultural sprayers, they, you can only turn them on and off about, with about a 500 millisecond uh, reaction time. When I was working on Pampers nappies, we were turning hot milk glue off every 20 milliseconds. So we know that the technology is there to be able to, to make that work better. Um, the kinematics and detection of um, getting the AI fast enough um, to be able to detect in real time uh, is challenging. Um, making sure the camera can detect the slugs. Um, it's very easy when we pose the slugs and stick them out, but how easy is that going to be uh, detecting slugs at night? They tend to come out at night in the autumn um, and in the damp. Uh, integrating multispectral cameras, RGB cameras and lights. There's a whole raft of work on that. Um, and there's a whole raft of work on how we can test and verify our results. So how do we work out how well we're working without going to hunt for all the slugs in the field beforehand? So there's lots and lots of really interesting challenges on this one. Um, but again, if we go back to our, our previous idea of if we can get our probe to a weed, we can then bolt anything on, on the end of it. Um, here we're, we're doing something similar, but we're now aiming to be able to spray the point that's been detected. So we, we're kind of getting it from both ends, uh, from both methods. Um, so that is um, a project which is progressing really, really nicely. Um, and every day we make a little bit more progress, a little more, bit more progress. And we're going to go around a big iteration loop on this one to make it better and better and better as we go on. Um, another project we've got um, is what we call PEZ. So PEZ is an electronic nose. Um, and the premise of this works on, so PEZ technologies, of the, a spin out, it's a spin out from Cambridge, Cambridge University, I think it is. Um, they've got a, a, a thick film sensor, um, which can detect volatile organic compounds from the soil. Um, and those volatile organic compounds will indicate soil health. Um, and here's a bit, sorry, there's a better view of our TOM 1.5. Um, so this was the previous to the TOM B3. Um, here you can see the PEZ unit, which does a soil sampling. There's a better view of that later on. You can see that was our kind of our previous robot. You can see how far we've, we've progressed. Um, and here is the PEZ unit itself, or the soil sampling unit. Um, it's got an auger in the middle, with 3D printed from plastic, so we can iterate really, really fast. We're not waiting for parts to be made. We make them out of plastic. We know it's going to break. And we'll keep going, we'll go round and round that circle, strengthening stuff, putting protection in. Um, and we, as soon as we get everything working on that, it works pretty well at the moment, in all honesty. But as once we want to make it robust, we've, we've then got everything working and we can press the button and make it happen. The way PEZ are working, um, so there's a big, again, it's an Innovation UK project. PEZ are taking lots of soil samples. They're examined with their electronic nose. Um, looking at the numbers that come out on that. Um, a load, those soil samples are then being taken to the universities and to soil labs, and they're doing a proper assessment on all that. All the data from this is being loaded up onto uh, an AI, not with us, um, but with, uh, I think it's Canterbury University. They're linking, uh, they're hoping to link all that data together. Um, and if that works, we'll then be able to use that AI training to be able to say the soil at this point is this and upload that data to Wilma. And Wilma will then be able to say, 
the soil in this particular area is really, really good or bad, um, which will again give the farmer loads and loads of data about exactly um, what is uh, soils, what is soils like. Um, but again, for us, if we ignore the PES part of it, we've now got a way of taking a soil sample and accurately geolocating that soil sample. So if somebody else comes up with a method of measuring NPK, nitrogen, uh, phosphorus and potassium, or pH or soil mo moisture, or something that is really useful to the farmer to be able to give an indication of soil health, the holy grail on this is uh, the amount of carbon that's stored in the soil, um, because there's a lot of people looking at this at the moment and they can actually, if you can measure the amount of carbon in the soil and you can prove that your soil is storing more carbon year on year, farmers could then get into carbon capture and storage, um, which they would, if they farm with good techniques, um, everybody believes you're building up your soil organic uh, amount. Um, so it's a, a tremendous uh, potential for, for us or for somebody else to actually go and, and do those measurements. So uh, that's PES. Um, I'm not going to show the modular platform again. It's the same as we saw um, previously. But with our philosophy is that we build up bits of robot and then reapply those bits on other robots to reduce our development time. Um, and part, part of my role is being, being doing the rapid prototyping is that we take a lot of the bits from the toy box, bolt them together to build another robot, uh, which can do whatever our, uh, the farmers want us to do. And we can then build that in um, and iterate that and iterate that and improve it as time goes on. Um, and it will reduce our time to market in time. Because so we're going to, you know, if everything goes well, you know, in two years time, three years time, we're going to have thousands of robots out in the field, um, all doing the surveys. Um, and just a little bit about my job. Um, I have a tremendous variety of different problems and different things which I need to have a little bit of an overview on. So, you know, I go from GPS leap seconds to the slug life cycle to matrix transformations to actually getting down and dirty with those robots when they, when they break down, uh, to soldering, to understanding growth stages of wheat, uh, high voltage safety, uh, which became very, very important to us um, when we, as soon as we got the, uh, the root wave boxes on there. How do we train AI? How do we collect data? Um, and the day-to-day -day job for me is a, it's a really fantastic um, intellectual challenge. It's probably the most challenging thing I've done um, uh, in my, all my careers. Um, and that is everything for me. So are there any more questions? And Fantastic. Thank you very much, Andy. Um, yeah, there are there are quite a few questions and uh, we are getting some nice uh, things coming in on the chat. Some uh, best wishes and many thanks, etc. for a very interesting presentation. Uh, we've managed to keep everybody who's uh, registered as well. So that's um, that's always a good sign. Um, OK, so if I may just ask, we've probably got um, about 10 minutes for questions. And uh, so do keep them rolling in. I'm just going to take some at random. Um, so one is, would your robots be able to work 24-7 and in wet weather? Okay, so yes, um, there are barriers to doing that at the moment. So if we want to work 24-7, we'd have to have um, a way of changing the batteries or having the robots they could drive up to a charging station uh, to make that happen. So, but yes, there is nothing that is there's no there's no technical reason why we shouldn't be able to do that um working in wet weather um yes again as long as we get our ip ratings right on that um but um i'm sure you've all worked out that um high voltage electric weeding is probably not such a good plan in wet weather um what will stop what will stop the robots working is um if the uh soil becomes so moist that everything sinks in there. Um, so there comes a point where you can't go on the fields without causing so much damage or having the robots bogged down. Uh, and that's, that's why we're so, so keen on the ground pressure part of it. But yes, we're aiming to get robots so we can run them for as long as, long as possible. 
um, in as many different conditions as possible. And uh, I mean, farmers won't go on the field if it's too waterlogged anyway. If it's at field capacity, then there's going to be yes. too much damage. And so nothing really goes on. Um, so a uh, little bit of a comment and then a question. Um, so as someone mentioned, well, the, the combination of the AI and the high voltage could then solve the uh, the robot rest rustling question. <laughs> uh, who knows? Yes. Bit of AI, a bit of a yes. zap. <laughs> yes. Um, what what about uh, tractor ruts and big potholes? Can the robot get stuck in those? Um, yes, yes, the robot could could. Um, of course, in time, our plan is that we don't have tractors on the fields, so there won't be robot ruts on there because our robots will be doing all the work and won't be damaging the fields at all. Um, one of the things, one of the reasons for having the robot handles at the moment is to. Um, when we're going out in the field, every, every day is a learning experience um, and they can spot where uh, there are big ruts. Um, but actually the, the robots, are, the, the Tom robot in particular, is particularly agile and has been designed to cope, cope with a, a wide variety of poor field conditions. But obviously there are, there's a point at which we'll tip over um, and there are holes which will be too deep for it to get out of. Yeah. Um, I suppose it's a bit of the Mars rover problem, isn't it? You know, if the crevice yes. is so big, it's not going to get out. But really, you, you want it to be as self-sufficient as possible. And you don't want to be running out to the field every hour to, to think, you know, go and yes. pull the robot out. Oh, the robot's got stuck again. Yes. And I think I think the, the more the more we run with robot handlers, the more the more time we get in the field, the more problems we see, the more we can engineer those out and, and keep going around the kind of development circle. Um, yeah. Uh, until, until all those problems are solved. Yeah, yeah, I think there will be a lot of human robot interaction. Yes. It's not going to be that everyone's told to go home and stop weeding and then the robots <laughs> are going to take over. It will be robots working amongst humans, with humans, and eventually, slowly, there'll be a balance. The, sh the balance will be shifted, I'm sure. So yes. I guess your robots have to be quite human friendly, really, as well. Exactly, yes. Yeah. That's why we've gone for the organic shapes on them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the safety systems yes. as well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, another question, we came in on the chat, actually. So just a reminder, just to use the quest Q&A, um, if you can, please. Uh, but it's about the slugs. So you've got two separate robots. One's recognising the weeds and then the other one's zapping them. But how does that work with slugs? Because slugs are constantly moving. And also you get slugs on plants as well. So they're not always at ground level. Yes. So that's why um, the... Having the edge AI on the slug bot is more important. So there's part of the project which I didn't talk about actually, which is kind of an academic part um, where we're going to be doing surveys of the fields and detecting the slugs and then repeating that survey after 24 hours, after another 24 hours to look at you know, where the slugs move, you know, what, what is the slug movement pattern, which nobody seems to know at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, so once that piece of data is gained as well, and we know that actually in the rain on a Monday, slugs like going right, we can then put that into our AI and we'll have an idea of where they're going. But the, the thinking at the moment is, Tom will go out and do the survey in the field, survey the crops and all the various information about weeds and crop health and everything like that. And also, because we, as we run the AI, it'll say, oh, you've got a big slug problem in the top left-hand corner uh, in that field, we'll know that, we did that on Tuesday. Slugs can move at one centimeter per hour, or whatever the speed slugs move. You draw a big circle around that and say, actually, all the slugs could be in this area, mm. uh, and off we go. The question of slugs hiding underneath leaves and underneath um, earth is a really interesting one. Um, that's why there may be some ground in multispectral cameras or mm. other ways of sensing slugs. You know, somebody suggested that you know, if you don't look for the slugs, look for the slime trails. Um, you know, that might be the way forward on that. So there's lots of other things to do, on, to do on that. But with the nematodes, as long as the nematodes are on the ground and the ground's damp, those nematodes will sit there for a long period of time. I think it's up to about eight weeks. So if we know the slugs are in the area, and if we don't quite get all the slugs in that area, and the slug crawls over that bit, poor old slug's going to get done by the nematodes mm, um, okay. anyway. So it's a, bit e it's a bit of an easier problem than trying to electrocute a weed um, but it does have its complexities as well yeah 
Uh, I mean, I know there's a lot of research, certainly at my university, which is Harper Adams University, it's agricultural university, there is research on slug movement and they, they have little chips on the slugs and they, they, they go out with a scanner to see where they've moved to and why yes. they're moving where they're going. So perhaps the results of that research will then help yourselves. Yeah, I'm sure it will, yes. Yeah, but then it leads us to a bit of an ethical question, which is actually one of the questions as well, is how do we get rid of the slugs? And uh, what about electrocuting the slugs rather than spraying them, etc.? Is there a bit of an ethical issue with slug control? Um, I think there is with, with any pest control. Um, you know, everybody's, everybody's okay killing weeds, but as soon as we start killing animals, there is a, there is a bit of a, um, an ethical issue on that. Um, um, and you know, it depends where we want to go on it. You know, one of the one of the problems with a monoculture is if you have a monoculture, so you have the same crop everywhere, you are going to get pests which will will breed really really quickly. So right. it might it might be in time that we instead of instead of having a field full of oilseed rape, you have a piece of oilseed rape, and then you have a, a bean, and then you have a potato mm. all next to each other, and that's kind of one of the future directions that we could possibly go in by having our Harry planting robot getting away from the big monocultures, which then solves, solves the slug or the pest issue. Mm. It's come full circle, hasn't it? So we're, you know, we could see a place where we could be back into permaculture and having multiple types of plants in a, in a small <laughs> area. Um, and I guess the reason why that isn't the way it is is because we've got all this mechanical farming. But if we've got robots that can just stay out there 24 seven, then, we could be heralding a new organic permaculture future. Yes. Mm. No. Yeah. Um, another question uh, from Jeff, what is the overall energy consumption of the system? And when it's weeding a hectare, I would probably imagine, you know, and, and how does it yeah. compare with the production, transportation and application of herbicides? So if you look at it, Side by side, energy in, energy out. Have you got any ideas of how it compares? Um, we've got, so the energy energy that we have to use is a bit commercially confidential at the moment. Um, and we've, we haven't done the piece of work which compares how much does it cost to produce this much um, herbicide compared to the electricity in the weeds, uh, which is a piece of work we will we'll do in time. Um, but what we're really aiming at is, is eliminating, our thoughts are that if we can eliminate the herbicide, um, plants aren't, aren't going to become resistant to electri electricity, um, we don't think anyway, but they are becoming resistant to herbicides. So we can yeah. accurately treat the weed, individual weeds with electricity and, and properly kill those um, and avoid the use of herbicides and all the residues in the field. Um, my feeling is it will probably be a little bit more expensive than just blanket spraying with a herbicide. Um, certainly until uh, all the herbicides get banned as, as will happen over a period of time. So it's, it's, that, it's that tricky balance of, mm. of uh, it's not cheap at the moment, but it's probably the right thing to do. It may become cheaper in time compared to herbicides because of the damage the herbicides do. Yeah, yeah. And, and the leakage into water courses, et cetera. Yes. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, another, it's not so much a question, it might be just a, a point or an idea. Have you considered using Sigfox for sending occasional information uh, to the headquarters just for security checking and monitoring from very remote farms? Yes, well, we, um, we're looking at all sorts of different ways of communicating with the robot back to, um, back to, back to headquarters or back to the, the kennel that's sitting on the farm. Um, we've got a project, we've got a 5G project um, going on, a rural 5G project going on at the moment. Um, but the communication, of, that commu data communication back, again, is a big piece of work that we, we need to do. Um, um, Sigfox probably can't take in as much data as we'd really want to send. Um, so I'm kind of thinking if, if a robot is fully autonomous in time, we'd probably want to send live video of the whole it's dug itself into or the mm. deer that's trying to attack it or the, the youth that's trying to nick it, um, we'd want to send quite a lot of data back. So uh, mm. Sigfox may not be the right one. 5G possibly, possibly um, satellite, um, satellite data 
who knows but yes it, it is it is a an interesting one there is a, a very interesting talk on iet tv actually which was about the development of the the dyson robot vacuum cleaner and they tested this out i think they released about 2000 of these all with cameras on them to see how they were being used so these were you know prototype robots and they were constantly sending data back cameras etc to see how the robot was being used so it's quite it's quite entertaining really because one of the cameras just went completely black and that's because one person likes to put a doily on top of their vacuum cleaning robot and, <laughs> and all sorts you know everyone interprets how the vacuum cleaning robot should look i suppose so yes uh, yeah yeah uh, yeah but it's all about gathering data in situ because yeah, yes you never know what it's going to come across yeah um Ken mentions that there's a firm in Cambridge that's developing an electronic sniffing nose for medical purposes. I don't know if you're aware of it and, and if you'd considered anything like that. Um, yes, there's, there's quite a lot of people out there with electronic noses. Um, and it, it, for us, it becomes, because we're, we're only small, there's lots, lots, of, lots of people phone us up every day and saying, can we stick your set, this sensor of ours onto your robot? And we've got to be a little bit selective about what we do. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's only 50 of us at the moment, but uh, you know, the, the, the possibilities are are, are massive. Um, yeah. and, and I think I think the electronic nose with Pez has has kind of good legs to run with, and there's there's lots of other stuff out there. Um, and in in two years' time, I'm sure there'll be even more with with the generation of AI and yeah, um, thick, thick uh, film sensors. And it just goes to show that. The development of sensors and the development of robots i mean they're they're separate but they belong together uh, yes. and as an engineer we see things in compartments really so you've got your robots your navigation your ai you've got your sensors they could be developed as long as they can bolt onto that then you could use any type of sensor um with a, the right kind of communication so yes yeah yeah wonderful okay i think we're going to uh bring it to a close there i think you've done a, an absolutely sterling job andy and um including the the time when i just dropped out with my internet which has never happened before i've got broadband and i'm plugged in so um luckily we've got uh, deborah from the iet as well and she actually held it on as host and then i had to rejoin and then be made as host so uh yeah yeah I, but uh, and i came back on and you seem to be coping with questions very nicely so Thank you so much, Andy. It's been really, really good. We've had some great um, uh, recommendations within the chat as well. And uh, I'll get back to you on that. And just to tell everybody that the blog will continue. Um, I'll put a link into the blog. So please go on to there. You, you might have to uh, log on to the IET website, but you don't have to be an IET member. You can just uh, sign up and then you can put more questions in the blog as well and, uh, and, and carry on the conversation. And this will be uh, available on YouTube. It usually takes probably a bit less than a week and I'll put it up onto the YouTube channel. There is a link to our YouTube channel on our IET Northwest Midlands website from the, the, uh, the top there. So yeah, the chats are coming in, uh, a lot of appreciation. So I would say this is basically a virtual round of applause. And uh, thank you very much, Andy. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. It's been, a, been an interesting evening. Thank you, and thanks for all the interesting questions. I look yeah. forward to looking at all the comments and, and ideas. <laughs> Great stuff. OK, so we'll bring it to a close there. Uh, so I'm going to switch off now. But uh, yeah, thank you, everyone. Have a lovely evening and especially Andy. Uh, have a fantastic evening. Well deserved. Take care. Thank you very much. Good night. Cheers. Everybody. Bye. Bye.